Colleen is uh, ill today, so we don't have Sunday school. So I wanted to start with the kids. Do you guys like Dr. Seuss stories? Like the cat in the hat? Do you guys know the story about Yertle the turtle? Yeah. Do you know that one? Anybody else know that one? That's one of my favorites. That's the one I remember the most vividly as a kid. Yertle the turtle, for those who don't know, was, um, we might call him kind of a narcissist, right? He's, he's a turtle and he believes that whatever he can see, he is in control of. He's the lord of the swamp. And so he wants to get a higher view. So he makes, what does he do? He makes all the other turtles do what? Stack on each other. They all got to pile up on top of each other. And then he goes up on top. And they do a few, and he's like, okay, that's okay, but I want to go higher. And he gets more, right? And more. But what happens to the turtles on the bottom? Yeah, they're like, the shell's almost cracking, right? There's this one turtle, Mac, who's at the very bottom, and he just can't take it anymore. And he gives a loud burp. Do you remember that? He burps. Because he just can't take it anymore. And the whole tower comes crashing down. And Yertle, who wanted to be the lord of all the swamp, is the lord of what? The mud. Yeah. That's Yertle the turtle. Well, I was thinking about Yertle the turtle when I read our scriptures today. Because we, like Yertle the turtle, want to know that um, life is all about us, right? It's all about us, what we can get from life, how we're going to do. And so... Um, in our first lesson today, we have the famous story of Job. Job, who was the righteous man, he did everything right, and then everything went to heck, right? Everything got taken away. He lost his family, his wealth, his house, his health. He's trying to find out why did this happen. And all his friends, his so-called friends, come over and they're telling him, oh, it's because God doesn't like you. Like my uncle had a joke about Job. He said, you know, Job wanted to talk to God, and finally God answered Job, and Job said, why did all this stuff happen to me? I did everything right, and God says to Job, I don't know, Job, there's just something about you that ticks me off. <laughs> so Job is waiting to hear from God, and in today's reading, he finally hears from God, but honestly, God's answer is not much more satisfying than my uncle's joke. What God says to Job is, Job, I can't explain it to you because you're not God. You don't have the perspective that I have. You weren't there at the beginning of the world. You didn't see how all creation fits together. All you can see is your little story, and so you can't see things the way I do. And I've never found that very satisfying because I want life to make sense. I want bad things to happen to bad people, and good things to happen to good people, and it really ticks me off when that doesn't work out. From my perspective, I honestly would like to be God. <laughs> Not really, I don't want the responsibility, <laughs> but I want all the other stuff, right? So the main question in the book of Job is why me? Why me? Why is this happening to me? Our gospel asks a very different question. James and John, are asking the, another very human question, which is, what's in it for me? I've given up everything, Jesus, to follow you. I could have had a good career as a fisherman or a tax collector or something else. I'm following you. What's in it for me? Grant us, Jesus, that we'll be your number two and three guys. We'll sit next to you in your glory. We'll get all the goodies. What's in it for me? The problem with these very human questions is that they do not lead us either to happiness or to spiritual growth. You perhaps have been or know someone who's obsessed with those questions, why me and what's in it for me, very self-centered life. And you know what? Those don't tend to be the happiest people. They tend to be angry at the world because they never get a satisfactory answer it's never enough, right? What's in it for me is never enough because they're always comparing themselves to other people. I deserve more than that person. How come my life's not working out like theirs? And the why me questions can drive you absolutely bonkers. What Jesus offers us, what the Bible offers us, is a very different perspective. 
In order to find happiness and spiritual growth, we need to stop asking the wrong questions and begin asking the right questions, different questions. Not why me, but as a, I had a secretary once in another church who, who went through a lot of different, she was a lovely, one of those spirit-filled people. Some people, like we all struggle to have faith, some people have it as a spiritual gift. They're just radiant with faith, and she had this radiant faith. She went through a lot of hard times in her life, and when she got diagnosed with cancer, and everyone was like, how could you be diagnosed? You're so good. Why you? And she's like, why not me? Am I different than anybody else? Is my life somehow different? No. I have been given this diagnosis, and I have to make the best of it to be faithful. And in fact, she found ways. She was a very compassionate person. Actually, she drove me crazy because people would call the office and they'd be on the phone with her for an hour telling her all their problems. I'm like, hey, I'm the priest over here in the office. Talk to me. No, no. They wanted to talk to her because of her wonderful compassion. I was jealous. How come I can't have that, right? Why me? Uh, so she found a way to turn her adversity into ministry. We see that in people all the time. Catherine was telling me, I hope I don't, you don't mind me using you as, a, as an example, but about a year or so ago, you were in the hospital very ill for a long time. And Catherine told me, I have this amazing connection with these young women, many from other countries, right, who come in and I'm here long enough, I get to know them and I've become a mentor to them. Your illness, as awful as it was, and you know, struggles continue, was an opportunity to transform the lives of other people. That is incredible. I had another parishioner in my former church who I thought of as the female Job. She um, lost a daughter to a drunk driving accident, right, which could obviously lead to terrible anger and bitterness. She and her husband spent the rest of their lives working on Mothers Against Drunk Driving panels taught telling their story and, in fact, getting to know and mentoring especially young people who are dealing with alcoholism and have found themselves in these terrible circumstances. They volunteered with Special Olympics because they had a child who had disabilities. They had all kinds of struggles. Her husband came down with Alzheimer's. She cared for him and when he finally passed away and maybe she could have had a few years to enjoy her life, she was diagnosed with cancer. Um, and we, I looked at her and I said, how can you not be angry with God for all of this adversity? But what she was able to do was to ask this question, how is God inviting me to help others in my misfortune? It turns out that the very things we struggle with the most become opportunities to empathize, to connect with others, and to help them in their struggles as well. Henry Nouwen famously wrote a book called The Wounded Healer, in which he talked about the power of that vulnerability spiritually in order to minister to others. Instead of asking why me, or what's in it for me, the deeper question is how is God using this circumstance in my life to prepare me to serve others. And how do we do this? How do we make that shift? It is not easy. I don't even know if it's possible without the help of God, who shows us in Jesus Christ the perfect example of this kind of life. The book of Hebrews is talking about Jesus as the suffering servant. We learned in our Bible 101 class this week that Israel, when it went through all of its conquests and oppression, began to see itself as the suffering servant. In the prophet Isaiah, there are these beautiful passages where the nation of Israel is an example of God's grace and mercy to be a light to the world, to all the nations. And then in Hebrews, that idea is taken and applied to Jesus, who learned obedience through suffering by identifying with us human beings, by sharing all the struggles of our life, including being brutally beaten and killed, he learned obedience and was able to save all of us. 
because of his example, because of his gift, because of his life and death and resurrection, we have that same ability and privilege. The opportunity to shift our perspective, to ask different questions, and through the tough things in our lives, to be made available to minister to others. It happens every day. And when it does, it transforms the life not only of the person being helped, but the person who is helping. Because they feel and know the love and power of God that transforms their life in this world and prepares them for life in God's eternal kingdom. I pray that we might have the grace to see that perspective, to get out of our own way, to stop being so self-obsessed, and instead to see the many opportunities that God gives us to be a help, a blessing for others. May that be our walk. In the name of Jesus, our crucified and risen Lord. Amen.